Hi, I'm James, and in this video, we're gonna talk about asset class diversification, modern portfolio theory, and why now is a really good time for us to learn about and maybe put some of these principles into practice with our own portfolios. So what is asset class diversification and modern portfolio theory anyway? Well, the short of it is basically, don't put all the eggs in one basket. However, it gets a little bit more complex than that. So which baskets do we put them in? And what are those baskets made out of? And what if the building where we store those baskets catches on fire? I think you see where I'm going with this, but basically modern portfolio theory and asset class diversification helps us think about how we diversify beyond just which stocks to pick, but also which asset classes we're investing in to make sure that we don't lose all of our wealth. If you had only invested in the stock market in the 1920s, specifically 1929, all the way up to the top of the market in 1929, then you may be like this gentleman here. And over the next six years, you would have lost 70% of your value or wealth, whatever you'd like to call it. However, if you'd have just had 20% of that whole portfolio value invested in gold, a different asset class, then you would have only lost about 34% of your net worth through that period of time. And that's because the stock market dropped around 71, 72% over those next six years from 1929 onward. However, the gold market or the gold price um, more than doubled in that same period. Okay, so let's talk about modern portfolio theory. So modern portfolio theory was actually developed in the 1950s. And essentially what it looks at is based on the asset allocation that we have in our portfolio, looking at the risk and reward for each of those assets, what would be the optimal portfolio makeup to minimize our risk whilst maximizing our expected returns? And this is called improving or maximizing our risk adjusted return. Now it sounds very wordy, but quite simply, it's basically just how can we spread out our risk and make sure we still get you know, um, the maximum possible gain that we could get from our investments without you know, betting it all on, on one, without putting all the eggs in one basket, such that you know, if, if something happens, we don't lose all of our investments. So modern portfolio theory considers two main types of risks. Number one is what's called systematic risk, which basically means the market risk of our investments. So for example, if we're buying stocks, well that has some market risk associated with it, which is the risk associated with investing in the stock market more generally. But then there's the second component, which is the unsystematic risk. Now that's the specific risks associated with that particular stock that you invest in. So for example, those kinds of risks might be, you know, their competitors. Um, how likely they could be disrupted, um, you know, and all those types of uh, risks associated with that specific stock that you'd be potentially investing in. However, that particular stock, not only does it have unsystematic risk, you know, specific stock risks associated with that company, but it also has the broader market risk of the entire stock market. So then when we're thinking about improving our risk adjusted return, you know, improving our expected return and reducing our risk exposure, well, we can do that by not just improving on the unsystematic or individual risk of each stock that we invest in, but also by reducing the market risk, which is the stock market risk. So how do we do that? By diversifying into different asset classes. So not just investing in stocks, but also maybe investing in real estate or uh, commodities like gold and silver, or even something that's quite new, which is the cryptocurrency space, so digital assets. Um, and even things like art can be included in this um, category, investment category. 
So before I go down the rabbit hole and make this too complicated, um, maybe it's best that we go over some examples. So let's jump on the whiteboard um, and let's work through a couple together. Okay, whiteboard time. So if we have a look here, we can see that um, on the y-axis, I've got expected return, and on the x-axis, I've got the sort of risk associated with that investment. So what we wanna do is we wanna increase on our expected return as much as we can, whilst minimizing our risk associated with those returns. So let's do a couple of examples. So I'm gonna plot up on this graph where I might think a company like Tesla would sit. So I would imagine Tesla to be high risk, but also high expected return. It's, um, you know, it's an innovative company um, and you know, I won't debate it, but um, you know, let's just assume it's got a high expected return in the future. So that's Tesla, high risk, high expected return. Now let's plot another company, one that's in Australia, um, that's an example that I'm familiar with. And I'll do that in, I'll do that in the same color. And this is gonna be ANZ Bank. Now the big banks in Australia are very stable um, and they've had good performance over time. Recently they've had some disruptions, but most um, financial services firms have given the climate. So where might they sit on here? So ANZ's lower risk than something like Tesla. So maybe it sits around here somewhere. And it's, you know, not as high expected return. Whoops. ANZ. Now, probably this isn't completely accurate. Um, ANZ should probably be a little bit more to the right, actually. Maybe they're about here. Now, both of these companies they are both exposed to the market risk of stock markets. Well, we've done something good here because we've included one Australian stock, which is exposed to a different equities market, sort of. Um, and then we've also picked a US stock, Tesla, which is exposed to a different equities market. Now, generally these, these two markets move quite um, you know, closely linked, so they're quite highly correlated. So their market risk is quite similar in this example. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a different color and we're gonna add in a different asset class onto this list. So now we'll add gold. So gold is much lower risk, almost no risk, but it's significantly less high return relative to something like, you know, these two. So maybe we'll plot gold here. So previously, when we just had ANZ and Tesla, our kind of it's our kind of um, portfolio expected return and risk was somewhere in the middle it was maybe here somewhere right which means we've got a lot of risk associated with that expected return much like our gentleman in the 1929 uh, in the 1920s who was exposed to just the equity market in this example now, if we add gold to our portfolio, which is a different asset class that has a different um, risk and reward characteristics or risk return expected characteristics compared to these two equities, well, what will that do to our portfolio allocation in terms of its risk reward? Well, depending on the weighting of how much gold we have, that's actually gonna quite substantially reduce our risk in our portfolio. So it's going to reduce our expected return maybe by you know, a little bit, maybe to here, but it's gonna reduce our risk by this much. So it's reduced our expected return by a small amount, but it's reduced our risk by quite a large amount here. And so this is why um, having different asset class allocation in our portfolio, it actually improves what's called our risk adjusted return. Because the returns we're getting with respect to the risk that we're taking is actually much greater than if we were to just say, put all of our money into something like a Tesla. Now the limitations of modern portfolio theory is that it's kind of looking at historical data and information around you know, the risks or volatility associated with each particular investment that we might be looking at. 
So when people actually model this kind of thing, you know, the examples that I've done, it's kind of just, oh yeah, that's about right, that's about right. But if you were to kind of um, do this exercise properly, you'd be looking at the historical um, price information of each of the asset classes and you know, getting into the nitty gritty of the details. But as we know, the past isn't necessarily the future. And what we're doing with this model is we're kind of saying, what is our expected returns in the future with respect to its risk in the past and based on past performance? So that's probably the main limitation with this. And then the other part of it is, well, we have to make some assumptions around what we expect the future to look like based upon the past. So we're making assumptions about the future, which may not entirely be true, but it is a useful framework to think about, you know, how we might be sort of uh, maximizing our upside potential, but minimizing our downside potential, reducing that risk factor. So if we look to history, it's quite clear the importance of considering asset class diversification in our own portfolio construction. So if we go back to 1929, well maybe this gentleman here, had he been practicing asset class diversification, he wouldn't be needing to sell his car. And as the buff says, rule number one, don't lose your money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. So that's it from me today. Hopefully this gives you something to think about when constructing your portfolios in the future. Um, so, you know, it's great that we can go out and use all these ratios that I talk about on the channel to analyze each individual stock. But in reality, the entire share market, regardless of those ratios, could go down um, in, the, in the near future if we look to history. Um, no one knows what the future looks like. And so we can incorporate this kind of thinking into the way we build our own portfolios to make sure we protect ourselves from that unknown. So thank you for watching and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Cheers.